Good evening, everybody. This. <laughs> Don't look like one. Not with my Tweety jacket. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, the last of our uh, main lectures. We've got one more session coming up, which is Members' Night in, in May. Um, welcome, particularly if you're new to the lectures or to the society. Uh, and if, if you're one of those and you're not a member, then uh, please come and speak to me uh, or Ian over here. Uh, uh, and we'll be uh, delighted to give you more information and help you join if you'd like to. Um, does any of the council members have any announcements that they'd like to make before we get started? Oh, silence was the loud reply. Good. Okay, so we'll move on. So uh, our speaker this evening needs no introduction at all, unless you are one of those people who haven't been before uh, and aren't in the society, David Webster. It's the honorary secretary of the society, um, and he'll he's in regular touch with uh, pretty much all of you, uh, just about um, administrative matters and organisation of the events that we have. Um, and uh, I should know this. I don't think that might be. Is it working? It is, but it's record. It's for the recording. It's for the recording. Okay, so it's not coming through the speakers. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll give you a biography. You may not know some of this. Um, so David's a reti retired oil company geologist, and he says he juggles his time between Glasgow and Isla. Um, what a wonderful combination. Uh, he graduated from Oxford University in 1976, which is the year I was just starting out, my degree. Um, uh, and later on, he did um, uh, master's degrees in environmental management and working on the geology of the Colonsey Group on Isla. Um, and uh, he's a prolific writer of guidebooks. Uh, he's written uh, two guidebooks in various editions uh, on Isla Jura and Colonsey, which many of you will probably be familiar with. Um, and uh, of course, he's the secretary of this society. He's a board member of the Fossil Grove Trust. And all of you will be very familiar with David's phenomenal energy, um, in uh, particularly with the Fossil Grove Trust in uh, in moving forward this wonderful place and and uh, um, getting it back up to speed for everybody to enjoy. Um, so the presentation this evening is on Neoproterozoic glaciation in Scotland, the Port Askeg Formation. Uh, over to you. Okay, um, welcome and thanks very much, Simon, for that introduction. Um, as I say, I've been the last. The last 15 years I've been do dodging around going to Isla from Glasgow and I've been looking at all the geology of Isla and I got involved with this major project to uh, study, uh, report and produce a huge academic memoir on the Portage Cave Formation. And it's going to be published later this year. And basically a huge team has been formed and these are most of the but not all, and apologies if I've missed anybody out. The core team is in the top left corner, led basically by Tony Spencer and Ian Fairchild. Uh, it, it's a multidisciplinary team. We've got glaciologists, sedimentologists, geochemists, um, all sorts of people, uh, petrologists, um, you know, a huge variety of uh, people have done this. So this is just the work of, I'm just summarizing their work. Um, I'm part of the team, but not a specialist. And uh, these guys are, uh, contributed to a major work. It really stems back to Tony. Um, um, and I'll talk about Tony in a second because this is a slide of code. slightly out of order. I wanted to just introduce where the where the Port Ascade formation actually is. Um, and you can see that broad belt, belt of green rock that extends up from Peterhead right down to sort of uh, County Galway, right across the, uh, the breadth of the British Isles and, and, and Ireland. And the red dots are the sort of main key outcrops. And I'm going to focus in on the, probably the best bit, or almost certainly the best bit, which is in Isla, and the very, very, very best bit in the Garvelic Islands. And we'll focus in on that. You can see the Garvelics there up towards... Uh, the Firth of Lawn, that little brown, little brown islands, with the port, which are almost entirely the Port Askeg formation, and then the brown little bits of brown in the northeast part of Isla that are also the Port Askeg, and the dominant rock that from these in these islands there is the uh, is the Jura quartzite, which forms the prominent, perhaps that's the yellow, 
Yeah, and it forms the low the lower hills of, uh, of Eastern Isla as well. So that's where we're going to go tonight. We're going to be in all these in Isla and the Garvelix tonight. There's Garvelix. There's Isla. So back to Tony. <laughs> Tony wrote his PhD on the Port Askeg boulder bed, as it was known at the time. And you can see the date at there, 1966. Uh, the boy's doing well. He's, uh, he's doing really well. He's the most agile 80 plus year old I've ever met. Um, and this is him. Well, I think that's him in the background there. And this is Wally Pitcher, who is his supervisor. And Wally and um, Kilburn wrote the definitive paper at the time on it and defined these diamictite beds. I'll talk about diamictites in a minute, what they are and what they aren't. Um, but you can see this is classic 1960s geology with your suit and your tie and his, <laughs> and his, and his, and his keen young students uh, on the Garvalic Islands, uh, not the field gear we'd use today. So this is Tony in the, in the 60s. Um, this is Tony a few years ago, uh, looking down up from Garvalic, looking across at Akuli and, and uh, Ilika Neve, the Saints Isles in the, in the, in the background. And in 1971, his PhD was, was reformatted into a, ver a memoir, Memoir 6 of the Geological Society of London, 1971. And it was written by one guy, Tony. Tony then, after that, worked for oil company, worked with me in BP for a while. And he went to Statoil, latterly in Statoil. And, on, and he kept an interest in the Port Askeg, and he always wanted to, in his retirement, was rewrite the memoir. So it just wasn't enough. It was, it was out of date. It needed re revamping, and he wanted to do it with the team. So that's really where we're at, why we're here, why I'm here today, because Tony said, I need a team. And you saw some of the team in, in, the, in that early slide. The new memoir, um, it was supposed to be 22. It slipped to 23. Uh, whether it will hit the street uh, for purchase and looking at in the late 24, hopefully. We've got one more. One more season of field work. So I'm going to the Garvelix and I'm going to do some work on Isla. And the, and the, the team are assembling in Isla and the Garvelix in, through May. And then we, hopefully we'll get the thing written and peer reviewed later on into the year. It's got 16 chapters. Each one of those will be an hour lecture, if not longer. Plus talking about snowball earth and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to give you a very quick tour through this stuff. I'm going to rush through it unashamedly. You can watch the video later. Read this later, but if I went into each of those in the detail that's in the memoir, we would be here until next week. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit of detail probably on chapter 15, because that was the one that was given to me to write. Um, so I'm going to talk about the provenance of the sediments and the class, and I have brought some class, some granitic class here for you to have a look at, because they're quite interesting, and I'm going to talk a little bit. So some of the detail will be on chapter 15, okay? And, and I'll finish with what it all means in chapter six, for chapter 16, and we'll race through the rest of it quite quickly. Uh, there's something for everybody. There's geochemistry, there's petrology, there's glaciation, there's uh, sedimentology, and there's one fossil. <laughs> and there's a story about fossils too, so we've got something for, something for everybody here, yeah? Okay, so we're going to jump into the Precambrian. So we're talking the rocks are older than 539, which is the latest date, I believe, for the base of the Cambrian. And we're talking about the very latest Precambrian. So we're up in the Neo Proterozoic, the late Proterozoic. For those who are not familiar, the Proterozoic is the upper part of the Precambrian, divided into three Neo, Meso, Paleo. Um, we'll, these words, Neo and Paleo Proterozoic, will get banded around a bit during the talk. So kind of remember where we are. So the Archean is, people think of the Archean as Louisian is Archean, and it's older than 2,500, but obviously younger than the Earth at 4,500. And then we've got, uh, what we're going to be talking about is the Cryogenian. The, game, the name gives it away, it's when there was ice. Yeah, it's the Cryogenian. And we're talking, so we're talking 700 million years ago, roughly, um, in, the, uh, in the latest pre -pam. There we are up there. So let's turn that on its side, and we've got the near Mesoprotozoic to the left. The boundary at the base of the Tonian is about a, is, is just arbitrarily set a thousand million years. It's very arbitrary. It's not a defined boundary. Remember, all the boundaries above in the Cambrian are all based on fossils. There aren't any fossils here, or any defined fossils. There's some 
some some forms of life we can see near the Carlin, but uh, basically the place is fossil free. Um, it's very difficult to make. So with your, your whole stratigraphy is is based on other things, which we'll come on to. Um, so we've got this division of the Neoproterozoic into its three, and then we're going to talk about the, the Cryogenian. I'm going to sit down because my knee's a bit dodgy, and my back will get sore if I don't. I'll stand up and arm wave in a minute, but I'll sit down for a sec. So um, the Neoproterozoic in Earth history is, is, is really characterized by three pan-glaciations. When I mean a pan-glaciation, it's, it's a, a, a glaciation that is believed to have covered the world. Whether it was a snowball earth or not, that's something we'll talk about. But uh, uh, worldwide, there are glaciations in the Cryogenian that, uh, that are seem to be in the rocks of that age. You find them everywhere. Yeah. And they're traditionally now, they, they, in the parlance, they seem to, there was some old words like uh, Varangian and all sorts of other words, but, and Riffian and things. But there were, the, the common parlance now is that there was the Sturtian glaciation which is believed to have started around about 720 and extended for about 60 million years. So quite an extended period of glaciation. And then we have the Maranoan. They're both Sturgeon and Maranoan are both uh, places in um, Australia, in the Adelaide Basin. And that believed that finished at 635. It was still Precambrian, and it's the sort of second of the two major glaciations. And for reasons we will discuss and I'll talk about today, tonight, we think the Port Ascate is a Sturtian glaciation, though in the literature you will find other people saying it's Maranoan. So that's part of the discussion tonight. And then we'll look at some of the evidence, yay or nay, for Maranoan against Sturtian as a, as a date for it. There's another wee one as well up in the Edicarlin called the Gaskiers. That's a new, I think it's Newfoundland. I think it's Newfoundland. Um, and it's a bit smaller, so I've drawn that as a little little a triangle. Um, and and the, there is some some evidence of that um, in various places, and it may be it's worldwide as well. But it was a sort of quite a ditty one. We're not going to talk about that tonight. Um, you may have heard of golden spikes. This is a sort of a strat stratigraphical way of the of the international stratigraphy and geology community nailing the definitive point in the world where the particular base of the Jurassic, Cretaceous, Triassic, whatever it is, it starts. It's always the base of something. And we have a golden spike from the base of the Cambrian. It's in Newfoundland. We have a golden spike, and then you can picture of it there, of the exact place that Idiacaran starts and where the Cryogenian finishes. And it's in, it's in the, and it's the, that's the termination of the Maranoan glaciation. The, the, underneath the little disk is a glacial rock, and above it is a carbonate rock, and that is exactly the boundary. And we're going to talk about Snowball Earth, because what we're going to talk about is whether there's a golden spike for the Cryogenian and where it might be, and it might be here. So I'm going to just talk quickly through Snowball Earth, um, its sort of concepts, very quickly. Um, this, this is another part that could take an hour, but it's not going to. It's going to take three minutes. Uh, there's the BBC picture of uh, what the Snowball Earth was, was like. Um, so how did... The Earth get into a snowball if, uh, type uh, event. Uh, it probably was already cold, and there's reasons for that. A low latitude supercontinent, there are ways of meet the ocean currents. There's probably the Earth was pretty cold. And then something drastic happened, and we think volcanic eruptions at low latitude with a lot of silicate weathering and a lot of sulfur. You've heard about sulfur today in these ship emissions. Are, uh, uh, once we clean this, the air, so sulfur is a cool, it cools the Earth, yeah? I, so we, we think there was actually a volcanic eruption through evaporites in Canada that may have flipped the Earth into this state. And once it gets going, we get an albedo effect, and the sunlight reflects back off the snow and the ice, and it just gets a runaway. Yeah. So we think that's what happened 700 million years ago. But we haven't got one today. Well, we're in an ice age, but we're not in a snowball effect. So and we all survived the snowball. Um, in fact, the there's a theory that uh, in these little brine pools in the middle of Snowball Earth, that the, the, uh, the, the extremophile bacteria that like could just about survive in those very extreme places, then radiated to be everything else, including us. So if you talk to some people, they say, we are the survivors of Snowball Earth. Everything on Earth survived. Because people say, well, if it's complete snowball, ice everywhere, everything must have died. But it didn't, because we're here. How did we get... Uh, out. Well, we think there was a buildup of volcanic gas, CO2, during that 60 million year period, shall we say. 
because all these silicate rocks couldn't be weathered anymore, that there was no pull down of carbon dioxide through silicate weathering, eventually that heating overcomes the albedo effect. So that whole feedback loop starts to sort of get, get back into, 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 into uh, overdrive again. We get a rise in sea level, and we would expect to see intense weathering by acidic rain because we've got a huge amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So these are the sort of symptoms and signs of, of, a, of a snowball earth, we're getting in and getting out. And we'll look at the Port Ascague formation and see which bits of this fit with that story or don't fit with that story as we go through this evening's talk. The last bits of a snowball in th snowball theory suggest that the, after you've got a glaciation, you get all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and you get a huge amount of sea level rise and a huge amount of carbonate precipitation in deep water. And that's what's called a capped carbonate. Here are three capped carbonates from Namibia, the Yukon, and Australia, where you've got a very, very clear break between a very between a glacial deposit and uh, a carbonate deposit. And it's like a cap, so that's why it's called a capped carbonate. I don't know the name of the guy, this guy here. You may have heard of him. Hoffman. This is Paul Hoffman. He is Mr. Snowball Earth. He, he has written extensively on it. He is the world's authority on Snowball Earth. Um, and Namib Namibia is where he did his initial research in the sort of 90s and came up with it. And it was this guy, Dan Scrag, who was his, uh, one of his PhD students that, that, that worked out the whole chemistry of why we were getting this break from diamictite, a glacial deposit with huge clasps in it to a carbonate. And it was Dan, who's a geochemist, that worked with Paul. And uh, so, um, yeah, the, the, they, are the, they are the experts in it, still around today. Um, and they're fundamentally part of the, uh, the whole snowball story. So let's have a look at the world. The world was basically a supercontinent called Rodinia at 720, um, 720 million years ago, at the beginning of the Sturtian glaciation. Um, the continents are in the sort of brown, the sort of shallow seas are in sort of uh, light blue, and the sort of deep ocean oceanic crust is in dark blue. And you can see you've got this low latitude uh, continent with everything clustered around the equator, uh, nothing much north or south of 60 degrees, no polar continent. Um, uh, and you have this thing in the middle called the flip which is the Franklin Large Igneous Province, which is the one I suggested to you earlier. There's a huge amount of basalt equate, um, erupted at the equator with, a, with no vegetation, so it weathered very quickly. It wasn't colonized by trees or bushes, grass. It was, remember, there's no grass, no land plants at this time. So it weathered very quickly, did a huge drawdown of CO2. We think it punched through a, an evaporite sequence. It chucked a lot of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. So the flip is seen as the sort of smoking gun as to why we flipped from a cold climate where we are now. If we had a, a flip today, we would probably go into a snowball because we're cold at the moment. We are, we're in an ice age. Most of us history, we haven't had ice at all anywhere. But we've got two ice caps reducing very quickly. But anyway, there's two ice caps at the moment. And if we had a big flip or a big meteorite, if the meteorite dinosaur meat killing meteorite hit us today, we would probably go into a snowball because it was hot then. But now it's cold. And we would probably it would probably tip us into that with all the with all the dust in the atmosphere and whatever. So these sort of catastrophic events at the wrong or right time, depending on which way you look at it, is uh, is, is responsible for these uh, this thing. And there, the yellow star is sort of where the Port Askeg is. Yeah, the green dots are explosions of exposures around the world of glaciations. You can see there's a key there. But uh, the G near us is East Greenland, East Svalbard, and you've got some in in the Urals uh, over in Baltica. Uh, so BA is Baltica, AM is Amazonia, and LA is Laurentia. They're the only three you need to know about because I'm going to come back to those in a minute. They surround the Port Ascate Depot Center, shall we say? Yeah. So we so we have this sort of shallow sea in bet sandwiched between Laurentia and Baltica, with Amazonia sort of hanging on the edge somewhere. Yeah. And I'm going to come to back to that story about these continents and what materials they may have shed into the Port Ascate formation when we talk about granites, which are the glass on the table there. Where did those granites come from? The Amazonian, Baltican, or Laurentian? Right. Let's go and look at some rocks. I think we're going to look at some rocks next. Before that, well, yes, we're going to talk about what is a diamictite. I keep using the word diamictite. I've used it already about 10 times, probably. Um, what is it? Um, I kind of sometimes think it's like trying to define pornography. You know when you see it, but trying to define it is bloody hard. Yeah. Um, so diamictite is a 
poorly sorted um, rock with lots of class in it. Usually the class are supported by the matrix. Right? They're floating. Yeah? So you've got lumps of class floating in a, in a sort of sand and mud matrix. And sometimes we use the word tillite. Sometimes the, the, this Port Askate formation was known as the Port Askate tillite formation. Now, diamictite is a word that's now used because it doesn't convey any sense of whether it was glacial or not. Whereas a tillite was always seen as a till or a tillite if it was consolidated, and it meant it was definitely a glacial rock. Whereas diamictite does not have to be glacial. Yeah, it could, it, it just a, it's a textural field descriptive term that says this is a rock, a poorly sorted rock. With, with, with mainly matrix-supported clasts in a, in a sandy clay matrix. Um, so it's, we, we, we kind of drop the word tillite. We use diamictite as the sort of definitive term these days. So how does it differ to a conglomerate? Yeah, it's got lump, big lumps. So a conglomerate has lots of big lumps, but they're usually rounded, and they, they're touching each other. So they're class-supported. Yeah? The sub class support each other, like ping-pong balls or tennis balls in a, in a, in a bin or a box. Yeah? Um, they sit on top of each other, and then the matrix, the sand, and the clay is sort of hangs around in between them. Yeah, and we've got a breccia, which is like a conglomerate, but it's angular. So there's a difference in angularity between a conglomerate and a breccia, and a difference in in in, in a diamictite is it's usually matrix supported, whereas these are class the class support each other, and you sort of can do a sort of funny triangle. This is not in the textbook, so I made this up. Um, but it sort of helps me in the field define what I think so what I would call a conglomerate. It's class supported, an angular breccia, a rounded class supported rock is a conglomerate. You know, and a rock diamictite could be could be angular or rounded. Not that angularity when it comes to diamictites. It's usually matrix supported, though. They sort of they're floating in a sort of muddy, sandy matrix. A very quick diagram just to show the variety of ways you can generate a diamictite. Yeah, I mean, on the left-hand side is an ice stream that's prograding into the sea and depositing its diamictite underwater, mainly. Yeah, And on the right-hand side, it's a it's an ice stream or an ice, uh, a land-terminating ice stream. So we have where the deposits of the, of the glacier melting or the ice stream melting are deposited on land. And we call that grounded ice. And the one on the left here these deposits are from floating ice or from sub, you know, or under, under submarine processes in, in water. So this is ice depositing stuff into water with all the variety of things that go on in a water environment. And this is a whole load of rocks that are deposited on land. Yeah. So we have this di di big division between grounded ice and floating ice. And this was the big debate in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and the early days of the Port Ascade. Was the Port Ascade the diamictites deposited by grounded ice or floating ice. And the, the Tony Spencer model was grounded ice, and the Eels and Eels model was floating ice. And if you read the literature on the Port Ascate from the 70s and 80s, you'll have there's quite a fiery debate going on between the same features, wedges, uh, conglomerates, folds, and a different, completely different interpretation of how they got there. And we'll come on to this. We're going to see some of these features and we can have a think about them. Those of you coming on the field trip, we will have a lot of chats about some of this sort of stuff as to what we're actually seeing um, and whether we'll be looking at grounded ice or floating ice. So that this, this argument we'll get into in the field quite a lot. It gives you an introduction to sort of the sedimentology of this sort of uh, system. Um, OK, let's talk about stratigraphy, just to sort of highlight where we are in the stratigraphy of, the, of these islands. This is, a, this is the sort of composite stratigraphy of Ayla, basically. I'm not going to go into all this. This is the Rins complex, Paleoproterozoic. You would, you would thought that because that's a sort of metamorphic and uh, granitic type basement, that it would be a, a sort of prime source for the class in the tillite, which is here. I have called it the Port Ascade tillite because I slipped into the old notion. We now call it the Port Ascade formation, not the Port Ascade tillite formation. But it sits there in the middle of the of the uh, Dalradian, uh, the base of the Argyle group, um, which is a which succeeds the Appin group. And we're sort of in this area here. We've got this sort of sandwich of limestones called li the Lossett limestone, limestones and dolomites that are sort of marine. They've got stromatolites. They're arguably quite warm, temperate water type limestone sequences. And it's overlain by the Bonnarvon dolomite, which has got stromatolites. Looks like it's a warm water type deposit. And in the middle, we've got this thousand meters of Diamictite. Yeah, so we have this, remember, we have this sandwich 
and a major climatic change. We think there's a major climatic change going on and then it comes back to normal again. So we think this is the abnormal bit. It's cold. The rest of it's quite warm, probably, and, and equatorial. So we've got this. Suddenly we've got evidence of ice at sea level at the equator. Now that's pretty unusual. We don't have that today. We have ice at the equator, but it's 5,000 meters up on Kilimanjaro. But ice at the equator today will be in a, in a snowball type situation. So that's the sort of background to the story in terms of stratigraphy. So that's the only bit of stratigraphy we're going to be talking about is the, uh, is the sort of underlying limestone sequence. Uh, in Isla, it's called the Losset limestone. In Garvelic, it's called the Garvelic uh, formation. Uh, Losset is a, is a wee village, a wee farm in Isla. And the Bonahaven dolomite is at Bonahaven. And it's put it put it is it's got its anglicised version in the strict um, British Geological Survey code, but everyone calls Bunnarvon by its Gaelic, the double N's and the BH's and things. So this is the composite stratigraphy of the Port Ascade Formation, and you can see it's just the Garvelix has the lower bit, and we've divided it into member one, two, and three, and Isla has the younger bit member four and five. So there are five members of the formation member in the in the lithostratigraphy scheme. Uh, what members become are smaller than formations and they can be divided into units. But uh, we have uh, five members and it's, and it's I'm going to be talking about these members for the next half hour or so. So yeah, it's useful to sort of get keyed into these things. The colors are there to tell you that we've got a lot of brown rocks at the bottom and a lot of yellow rocks top sandy yellow rock so there's a sort of what these we call white sandstones yeah so the whole thing a thousand meters of it is not all diamictite the diamictites of these things here in the sort of browny orangey colors uh, i did complain to tony that his dolomite color was pretty similar to his uh, some of his diamictite colors that's a bit but there's a dolomite here known as the main dolomite and there's a dolomite unit at top of member one called the upper dolomite and then these uh, two other things we're going to we'll keep I'll keep wittering on about the Great Breccia, uh, which is uh, here, near top of member one, and the disrupted beds. We're going to talk a little bit about those as well. They're unusual. And then we've got member two, which, which is basically brown diamictites with a few sands in them. Then member three is mainly sand. Member four is thick diamictite sequence with not much sand in it. And then number five is a lot of sand, quite thick sand. And then it finishes the Bonnerhaven formation. So that's here, the Bonnerhaven formation at the top. Remember, there's a carbonate sequence at the top. And this sits in the Garvelix on the Gar Elite formation, which is a carbonate sequence. And we're going to look at, look at, we're going to look at the Gar Elite formation on the Garvelix. So we look at member one, we look at member two, member three. Then we jump to Ayla, look at member four, member five. There's also a very thin bit of member one on Ayla, which we'll look at as well, which is, which is quite interesting. Great Breccia, these, the, all the diamictites are numbered, yeah? And it started off with Pitcher and, 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 uh, and Kilburn in the 60s, and Tony sort of refined it. So we, we, we go around the islands looking at, we are standing here on D33, D for diamictite, and they can see the numbers, yeah? 33, 34, 31, right up to 48. So we have 48 diamictite beds that we can identify, yeah? And we, we, these numbers here are stone counts where we looked at where Tony has did, diligently gone around every diamictite and counted the class as to whether they're uh, extrabasinal, granitic type things, or dolomitic or limestone class, intrabasinal, I belongs to the basin, uh, or whether they're things like quartzites and stuff. So we've got a whole uh, stratigraphy based on that because they the stone count changes as we go up. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next bit. Um, um, and we have this Great Breccia, which is D13, which we believe is a major glaciotectonic bed. Um, we'll show some pictures in a minute. Then we have a dolomite, which is unusual. Why have we got dolomite in this glacial sequence? Oh, it, traditionally, dolomites are seen today as hot water, warm water, sabkas, Persian Gulf dolomite, yeah? not glacial rocks. And we're going to talk about, I'll talk about dolomite and why we think we can get dolomite in a cold water, in a cold environment. But we have dolomite. And these brown, dolomite, brown sandstones and these brown diamictites are dolomite cemented. Yeah, and remember, dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate. Um, and we have these rocks, these yellow ones, which are white sandstones, which are quartz cemented. No carbonate cement at all. So we have this funny changeover from brown to sort of white 
So we keep talking about brown sandstones or white sandstones. I'll talk about that will come into the picture as we come through the night. So there's there's the sort of members stacked up in a row. There's a thousand, there's eleven hundred meters of it, and you add the whole lot together. And we've done some work on the class, as I said here. I'm not going to go into detail of this, but the point is that this orangey colors here are granitic clasts, like the ones on my table here. Yeah, and they increase as you go up, and they're not present at the bottom. And you have limestone class at the bottom. These are the blue ones here, which stop, and you don't get any more of them. And the dolom and there's some quartzite class that come that are there pretty much all the time, and there's some dolomite class which which are quite prominent at the base, um, and sort of decrease as you go up into the member four, which is mainly granite. And the, the traditional theory is that you're eroding into the base, the, the rocks that have deposited the Lossett limestones and the Garvelac formation, the, you're eroding them first, and then you're getting deeper, deeper glacial erosion in the source areas that get you down into the basement. So then we're picking up granites as, you, as, the, as the glaciation gets more and more intense and deeper weathering, you get, a, you get an unroofing, gradual unroofing story going on here. Yeah? And the, the geochemistry sort of reflects that, that you get carbonates, uh, calcite uh, in the bottom bits, um, you get, and you get a lot more, uh, um, and, you get, and, the, and, the, and the dolomite disappears as well, gets lower and lower. Yeah, so the, the geochemistry is picking that. It's also the geochemistry is telling us some very weird things are going on with weathering profiles. I've got a geo, this is, I'm not going to go into this, into the, into the uh, chemical index of alteration stuff, but there's a major changes between member one and member two. We think there's, some, there's a big stratigraphic break and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, weathering going on at, at, in and around this D13 area. So we've got these funny rocks, dolomites, breaches, the disrupted beds are magnetic, iron-rich siltstones with carbonate concretions in them. They're strange rocks. And something's going on with the geochemistry there as well. So this is a story starting to develop that there's a strange bit going on at the top of member one. In the in the in the in the, in the uh, port cascade. So the lucky people are going out to the Garvelics. They're going to be going out uh, from uh, Seal at Kuhn Ferry out to a field centre on Lunga, and then each day we will be getting the boatmen will come out from Kolapool and take us out to each of the three main islands there: Garvelak, the big one, um, Akuli, the wee one in the middle, and Saints Isle or Ayla Kaniv, uh on the bottom one there. Um, so that's where that's where that's where that we're heading. Um, this is this is the geology of the three islands with the ro islands rotated round. Yeah. So we're now we're up, sort of kind of upside down. There's north. Yeah. So this is a Garvelak here, um, and that's the uh, simplified stratigraphy. We've got member one, member two, and member three. Yeah. And member Arculi doesn't have a member three. Holy has a wee bits in these uh, little little uh, uh, scaries out to the on the south side here. And you can see here we've got the Garb Elak formation. So we have the base of the member one, the base of the Port Askeg formation exposed on the northeast coast of Garb Elak. And those of you who are coming, if the weather's right, that's where we're going to go first because we always like our geology story to start at the. Uh, at the bottom, yeah, the, the beginning, once upon a time type stuff. So once upon a time, there was no Port Askeg formation. There was a Garvey, like, then there was a Port Askeg formation. We go to Akuli and see some lovely stuff in there. And then the third day we'll go here. The weather might change all of that. No, but that's the plan. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. And we'll, uh, we have a, there's a Bothy here, a bit of shelter. We need it um, in here. We used to use this as a field center, but we now, the, the ownership has seems to have changed. It seems to have locks on it. so. It was an open bothy. We were using it quite extensively for the last few years, but we're now using the field centre on, on Lunga, which we can use. It's much more. Uh, it's still relatively primitive, but it's much more less primitive than this. This is this is take a shovel and go and find a tree to have a pee in. Um, and we, those who are going to Holy Isle, hopefully, will see some of the best sort of beehive monastic remains uh, in Scotland that haven't been. They're still there, historic stuff, and go there and strim the grass once a year and things like that. But we'll, we'll visit that monastic settlement too. So, promised your fossils. This is it. This is stromatolites uh, in the Garvelac formation. Um, this is Tony standing on them wearing his helmet. Uh, Tony had a bad injury on the island when he was on his own, knocked himself out and nearly died. And his wife won't let him go on his own, and he must wear a helmet. 
and, and, and gloves. <laughs> so he's recommending that those who come do the same. Um, but we won't be on our own, so at least we're, and we've got mobile phones. He had no mobile phone then either. So, and this is from Athelites in the Garabellic formation. They're, they're calcite, um, this is, and this is dolomitic sort of uh, siltstones they're surrounded by. Um, Garabellic also has signs of um, aridity, we think. Um, this is gypsum. So these are solidified, these sort of star shapes uh, are, are blades of gypsum in the mud. So we have stromatolites and gypsum. If it was today, you'd think it was warm. You'd think it was Shark Bay. You'd think it was the Persian Gulf, 40 degrees. Yeah? Um, we think it's a different ocean chemistry, different atmosphere, uh, different M magnesium ratios. The sort of things are different. The, the near project isn't the same as today. So um, things are slightly different. We don't, but we think it's more arid than it was cold, than it was warm. So it could have been quite cool, but, but arid. And we have here uh, a carbon isotope profile through it and this is this is negative carbon isotope this is this is nice and light my uh, delta 13c is quite quite negative and suddenly it turns zero and positive i'm not going to go into the re into into any of this but nevertheless this is known as traditionally in the literature as the Euler anomaly but it actually is on it only occurs on the garvelix and this is now now in the literature the garvelix anomaly so these these carbon isotope negative excursions are well, correlatable worldwide, and this Garvelic anomaly, Euler anomaly, correlates around the world, and it occurs below the first glaciation. So we we, we believe this is this is this is this is a, a worldwide correlatable um, um, carbon isotope and carbon isotope excursion. And it, where it goes, where it flips and goes zero, is in this bed here. And it's proposed that maybe that is when the glaciation starts, because this is arguably a temperature proxy. And, this bed may be, bed 39 may be the place where we could have our global stratotype type section, the golden spike, maybe in this bed here where we flip from uh, negative to positive carbon isotope, given there were no fossils of any. The other possibility is slightly higher at bed 48 is where we get our first, we get a periglacial uh, erosion uh, weathering surface and then a first diamictite. So stratigraph in terms of rock type, not geochemistry, this might be a better place. And this is part of the debate we're having um, as to whether we are proposing that line there or the changeover of carbon isotopes. Um, so this is the top of the Garvelic formation, and this is this is D1, diamic type number one. And this is diamic type number one, and it has lots of little isoclinal folds in it, so it's probably it's probably a, a push till uh traction till that's distorting the, the the surface it's running on and a lot of the lower d d feet d dynamic types in d1 to 12 and 13 have a lot of these uh glacier tectonic features in them and i'm not going to go into a lot of detail of them they have some court they have thin quartzite beds in the middle as well this is a sort of sandstone bed between d6 and d7 um and then we have D13, which is the, the sort of major thing, the Great Breccia. And we have these, this is, this is big boulder conglomerate. This, these, these things may have been uh, pushed and rolled and rounded uh, by the glacials, a huge, huge amount of ice pushing stuff about here. Yeah? And we have the bubble. This is known as, this is on the like a, like a need, Saints Islands. Uh, we might see it if we get the boat to go around to that corner of the island. It's not even, yeah. there's, a, there's a person for scale. Yeah. That is a huge isoclinal fold of the Garvelac formation in D13. So you're getting your terminology here. So you've got this uh, about 500, 400 meters below this is the Garvelac formation. And then up in the middle of these diamictites, we get a great chunk of it. Do it. Yeah, and this, is, this was known by the. So this is an isoclinal fold over here. You've got a fold axis here. And, uh, and a transport direction, the ice pushing it from the south east to the northwest. Remember that, because that's important when we come to the where do these things come from, because it's coming from the southeast. All the, virtually, all the, virtually all the indicators we see of gla glacier tectonic transport direction are to the northwest from the southeast. Um, this is the view that was on the first slide, I think, here. Uh, I put out here, this is, this is our coulee. And this thing here, is the Great Breccia, and this is a huge folded raft. This is our, the, the bubble is here. 
So this is also a folded, we call them a raft, because it's just like a huge chunk of rock that's been pushed by, like a bulldozer by the glacier, yeah? And folded, twisted, distorted, and then left, abandoned once the ice melted. And we have, there's the Great Breccia, and above it we have the main dolomite, a uh, very thick development of the main dolomite on our coolie. So we'll be walking on this wave cut platform around here, and it dips this way. The whole thing dips into the, it's very simple structure. There's not much structural geology in this whole thing. It's all nice, simple 35 degree dip to the southeast. We will go, we'll look at the main dolomite as we go around the corner and the disrupted beds. And this is the great breccia with the big boulder conglomerate in it here. And this is a raft of the Garvielic formation in the great breccia yeah, on the wave cut platform. And there's a dump of the dike in as well. Nice tertiary dike, Cenozoic dike. Now, at the top of the great breccia, uh, recent, made in, really recently discovered on one of the other little scaries of this, what we call an erosion surface above the great breccia. And we've got this thing called a jelly fluctite, which is a new word to me, probably a new word to most of you here as well. If you're, if you're, in the old days, we used to call it head. It was like solid fluxion debris. It was when we had a periglacial climate in the Ice Age, and you just got a load of rubbish at the top of the, top of the whatever the bedrock was. It just got, it got all churned up by the ice, um, smoothed down the slope, maybe, of the breccia of stuff. And we think these modern glaciologists, and that is one, that's Doug Ben from St. Andrews, who spent a lot of his time, uh, his, his main profession is modern glaciology, but he's uh, looked at this and said, oh, this is brilliant. This is, this, is, this is the deformation, even though this stuff has been to green schist, fascism, and metamorphose, you wouldn't have thought it. It looks just like it's fresh as a daisy. And he thinks these guys, these Antarctic, I mean, Doug spent a lot of time in Svalbard, but we've got Richard Wallow has been a lot of the time in the Antarctic, Mike Hanbury. They just look at this, this is just looks like recent stuff. And this is the Great Breccia here, and this is this jelly fuck type thing. It's arguable that this could be the place we've got this huge amount of ice pushing stuff about, then it all locks up, and then maybe nothing happens. And this, this is the time when we had all that funny weathering stuff, the the Geochemist is telling you funny things are going on. So if there was a snowball earth unconformity where nothing, the whole earth froze solid and stopped, maybe this is it. This is this is the place. Yeah, because you can't have a snowball when when you get a deposit of a gla of a of a diamictite, it's melting, it's not snowball, it's melting. You've got to melt to produce the diamictite. So you go around the corner on Arculi. There's the main dolomite. We think that's actually a fluvial cross bedded do detrital dolomite. Come on to that in a minute. And it's overlain by the disrupted beds. The disrupted beds uh, are have a lot of iron in them. And there's a picture of the disrupted beds. This these siltstones with these concretionary dolomites in them. It's a weird, weird rock. Yeah. Um, on Isla, the disrupted beds are a bit thinner, and you walk up to it, you compass it, and, and the compass moves 90 degrees. It's full of. It was full of originally hematite, but it's now metamorphic magnetite. But it's very iron rich. And there is very rare in the Earth history after the, the main sort of oxidation, the great oxidation event and the banded iron formations in the Paleoproterozoic and, uh, and Archean, suddenly in the Sturtian around the world we get iron. And it's, and it's, it's one of the giveaways of the, why this probably is a Sturtian deposit, because we've got iron, iron formation. And we think that's because we've got, we've had all the ocean water was, was the ocean water was separated from the atmosphere by ice, which allows the, the iron in the water not to oxidate. And it only starts oxidizing uh, when you get, add fresh water to it, when you start to melt it. So this is another symbol of, or symptom of this, the melting of possibly a snowball, that we get ice, we get ferruginous deposits in the, uh, underneath a melting ice shell. Now that, that is a whole lecture of its own, which I'm not gonna go into, but that is the current view that we have uh, we, we are seeing the symptom of uh, melting ice after maybe a snowball event, which has stratified the ocean into a ferruginous ocean. And then we get uh, fresh water comes in and oxidizes, and we get a deposit of iron in, in these sort of brine pools. Um, then we get uh, the upper dolomite. We get some erosion as well. The upper dolomite um, has stromatolites in it. So we're suddenly into this sort of stratolytic limestone uh, carbonate type deposit at the very top of member one, a um, very unusual deposit um, there. And 
we think that dolomitization is actually um, because we have very slow deposition with a lot of dolomite being eroded into it, a lot of dolomitic in the pore waters, and very slow sedimentation. So we get a we get a a, a, um, a, a diamictite with wedges and periglacial stuff with dolomite class in it. Get a marine transgression over it, yeah. With and it's with not much sedimentate slow sedimentation going on, and the pore waters create a dolomitic cement. So there's a whole dolomitization story. Another hour's lecture. But uh, you've got to accept that that's the current theory why we're we getting dolomites here. It's about sedimentation rate in a strange ocean with a lot of, a lot of magnesium with a high magnesium calcium ratio. This is the top of the upper dolomite again, and we get this is the base of member two, which is changing from, from a brown color to a gray color. So this is sort of this is our top of our, and we think maybe that this is the conglomerate, which is another glacio glacio tectonite is the sort of buzzword at the moment of a. Of a, of a rock that's been pushed around and jumbled up by glaciers moving around. In fact, a lot of glacial rocks, um, when you examine them in thin section and peel, acetate peels and things, they've got a lot of deformation in them, as you would expect. So deformation is, is actually uh, pretty ubiquitous in a lot of glacial rocks. This is a lovely exposure. If, we, if the weather's nice and we're, we're all, like a neve and our boat can get us in, we'll, you know, we'll, be, we'll be wandering all around on this surface. This is got, this is called, these are called sand polygons and they're believed to be periglacial cracks, like mud, like mud cracks, like hexagonal mud cracks, but in a periglacial, freezing cold, dry climate. The, rock, the top of the diamictite surface dries out and, it, and the cracks, it cracks into polygons like mud cracks and the cracks fill with wind blown dust so this is lewis filling the cracks so this is sand blown around into the cracks and then it's dolomitized because it got it's then got a marine transgression over the top of it which brings marine water in it so that it dolomites you get a dolomitic cement to the sand and they they, they quite hard and they stand up and we get where well, we, we get these polygons and sometimes you just get sort of sinuous Crack line wedges, we call them, and sometimes they're in, they into these sort of rectilinear and uh, sort of polygonal patterns. This is one of the nicest examples of, of sand wedges and polygons, and they're wedge shaped. They go down, they taper down, so they're like cracks that have opened up, filled with sand and dust. Um, we get some drop stones, telling us we've got sort of little. These are sort of muddy pools. Um, uh, filled with valves so we've got these are valves which are probably cyclical seasonal things um pools of open water in the summer and uh freezing in the winter ice comes over melts drops drops its uh, little stones into these little pools it's quite small that's there's your scale that's only a few centimeters long um, and we get um we also get involution folds which are again per periglacial things like frost heave you get these sort of features with the, the top surface of these valves gets all messed up by a periglacial event and you get this, these in, what we call involution folds um, and wedges as well. We've got wedges and barbs in, 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 in this. So we're still in number two. And this is a wedge. It's just a sort of, it hasn't got a poly polygon, but it just has this long wedge shape here. We have frost shattered stones. So remember, I was going back to this thing about was it grounded ice or underwater? Everything we've seen, we see today, we think in these member two stuff, is grounded ice. We don't believe that there's any evidence that it is all underwater, apart from the varves. Yeah. So we've got these pools of water, but are basically most of the diamictites are deposited by grounded ice, and the ice melts and it's and it's left in a subaerial place. Yeah. It's left on the land to freeze. Yeah. And then the then the sea level might rise and flood it with the sand, and then it then the ice come back again. So we get this cyclicity of sand diamictite, sand diamictite. What's very important here is that the erosion at the base of the sand is virtually none. So it must have been really quiet, either like, like, a, like a lake or a very, very small uh, restricted sea that didn't have huge wave fetch to have you know beaches and sand being eroded out because um, it, just, it just sort of sits on top. These wedges, they're just flooded by a, by a sand. We get frozen sand slabs that have been pushed around. These are these are slabs of sand that have been frozen and then pushed about. Um, you can see we get the con up here is a conglomerate at the top there above my D30. Um, it looks like that. That is almost 
almost certainly a deflation lag. What I mean by that is that it's a diamictite where all the sand and the clay has been blown away into loess and, and then fills the wedges. And then all the class don't move, so you just get this deposit that is just the lag of what's left that couldn't be blown away. Yeah? So these are the Antarctic geologists come along and say, that's what it is. Easy. <laughs> One of them. Seen it all the time in the dry valleys in Antarctica. And we get channels, we get river channels. This is uh, some work that Bruce Lavelle, who's talked a lot, talked to us before about the Jura Quartzite. He's done a lot of work and he's one of the key authors for the, for the sedimentology of the sand units in, 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 the, in the thing. And he's done a lot of work, Fasters Association's work with syndesmational faulting channels. Um, he sees a, 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 an analogous to a sort of a, a deltaic type environment. Um, uh, tidal delta, like the Mackenzie Delta. I'll talk, show some pictures of the Mackenzie Delta in a second. Um, we've got indications of water flow. We've got aligned pebbles um, uh, in these sort of fluviatile conglomerates. And there, there's the Mackenzie Delta in uh, North Canada, where you've got rivers going in all sorts of directions, little lakes, little pools. There's the site. That's the scale of the Garvelic Islands. So it's sort of a yeah. This is a big place with lots of with a very complicated topography. Um, and you you can then ima imagine that this is happening during sandstone times, and then there's in the uh, in interglacial, and then the glaciation and a glaciation pulse comes in and just sort of overrides that, and then the ice melts, leaves a diamictite layer, and then this then the, then the, the, the uh, sedimentation re reestablishes itself from the river, uses this tidal delta, and then the next diamictite comes in. So you get this fluctuation. It's like a Milankovitch cycle, probably. You're getting that sort of cyclicity of, um, of uh, sedimentation, fluvitile, deltaic type sedimentation for the sands, and then diamictites between them all. If you look north along from, from our coulee to our Garvelic, you'll see this is member two, um, mostly diamictite with some sands. And this is member three, which is mostly sand with some diamictite. Remember, I showed you the original one. It had member three had most of the yellow sand bed, the white sandstone. So these are these are four big white sandstone beds in member three. Yeah, taken from I believe it's lovely. A day like this, it will be lovely. We can uh, get out of here. Look at this. And in and in in member three, we as I said earlier, we. But all the stones are mainly granitic. You know, all these all these are sort of granitic type stones like I've got on the table. These are some of the literature you'll see are, um, are called giant crossbeds. These you can see here. This is interbed one in in, in, in member three, and you can see the size, scale of this crossbedding. This is enormous stuff. Yeah, these are tens of meters of thickness of of, uh, of crossbeds. Um, here's Roger uh, looking at uh, tidal sandstone into bed three with diamic type D38 here, sharp contact, not much erosion at the, not much erosion here, and not much erosion here either. So we, again, these quiet environments, um, um, the glacier just sort of dumps stuff on top, and when the, and the and the and the di and the marine transgression is quiet, low energy. Um, Interbed three has some drop stones. There's some granite, some lumps of granite, quite big drop stones. These ones, they're obviously sitting in this sand, so they're um, they're arguably drop stones. Because that was the argument that eels and eels had about uh, everything was underwater was that everything was a drop stone. Every big granite class would have to be a drop stone. Yeah. We only see, we only think we see a few in few beds, whereas everything else is in a till, diamictite till deposit on the land it's just the ice has melted and left it's left its load of mud sand and class where they were whereas these are dropped they're coming from floating ice dropped down onto the seabed and punching punching into the seabed the problem is because there is a bit there is a meta metamorphism here there's a cleavage and the some of the muds that you would like to see the drop stones wrapping around the, the laminations and the being piercing you find that the cleavage can make it very confusing. And uh, you'll see that, those of you who've been there or going to go there, you'll see, you'll have debates. Is it cleavage? Is it lamination? Is it a sedimentary feature or is it a metamorphic feature? And this is this is uh, Bruce's model, again, for these member three sandstones, a tidal delta prograding out into the thing with sort of abandoned uh, inactive and active lobes and all sorts of uh, Paleo currents going every which way, mostly, and you can see sort of herringbone cross bedding, cross bedding going this way, and then going back that way. 
side ebb, ebb, and, ebb and flow tidal ridges and all sorts of things. So there's a, a complicated sort of tidal estuary delta story for the white sandstones. So we'll jump very quickly to Isla. I don't know how we're doing for time. I'm going to just race through this. Um, on Isla, we have member we have a uh, member four and five. We also have a very little thin section of member one and a place called Ben and Bui, uh, which is dead interesting. And I'm going to uh, and the, also the Percibus complex, which is another glacier tectonic complex, very poorly exposed, but we believe it might be similar to the Great Breccia. So we do think that, but, but it sits on the Lossett Formation, the Garvillet Formation. We think has been cut out in Isla. We think there's been a lot of erosion here, by probably by the glacier that was depositing D13. It's just so if you've got these big folds of stuff and big conglomerates and rafts of stuff, there must be places where it came from, like the quarry it came out of. Yeah. So we think this 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 is the top of a crest at the crest of a tilted fault block at Ben and Bui that was eroded and what eroded by these massive glaciers at the we just coming into snowball earth time, shall we say. And we'll go to Ben and Bui, which is, and this is the Great Breccia equivalent unconformity, uh, top of the Great Breccia unconformity on Isla. This is this this bit of, this is nice cream dolomites from the Lossett Formation. This is brecciated stuff. This is, you can see this big class here. This is like a regolith. It's a sort of periglacial thing that, that it's got a topography because there, the, the, there's the base of the breccia here. And it goes right down here. Yeah. So you've got this sort of topography of a sort of crazy topography with blank flanked by periglacial screes overlain by a dolomitic fluvital sandstone with ripples in it. So this is um, a fascinating place. Some of you have been there with me um, to Ben and Bui and seen this, and it's uh, it confuses the hell out of people. These are these are Neptunian dikes of of sandstone coming down into this um, cream uh, non and dolomite. So um, you know a fascinating sort of outcrop. And we have a little barbed siltstone. That is a drop stone. There's no doubt that that is lamination. That's not metamorphic cleavage. That is that is the diddy though. That's only about the size this size. A little dolomitic clast uh, that's just fallen into this little little pool, little glacial meltwater pool. And this is the disrupted beds on uh, on Isla, which is, looks quite different to the ones on um, on Garvella because the, 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 we've got concretionally dolomite. Uh, this is diamictite with dolomitic diamictite, and these are iron beds that give you that that uh, distort your compass. Um, but this is these are we almost these are tide water submarine diamictites like the eels and eels story. So this is a, a rare example. We think this is underwater glacial marine sedimentation, um, and, and this brine pool effect when you, when the glacier sort of stops dropping its stuff. Get this brine pool effect, then the, the, the deposition of these uh, of these uh, uh, magnetic uh, hematite, well, originally hematite uh, uh, beds. It looks like a banded iron formation, but it's actually these are concretionally dolomites um, separating out. Uh, you can see you can see they sort of pinch and swell. They're not nice straight beds. Uh, you get it. You get member four diamictites and quartzites in uh, Port Ascague, the ferry terminal, um, like this. Um, again, these could well be, this is an example of, is this cleavage or bedding? Is this a drop stone distorting it, or is that cleavage being refracted around the granite? Granite, The granite won't hold the cleavage. The diamictite has mud in it, so it holds the cleavage. That doesn't. Um, and again, this is the, the debates out on this. We think we had, Tony had portrayed that the whole of the Port Ascague was all grounded ice, apart from a few rare bits and pieces. We are now trying to I'm going to show you some more evidence in a minute. We're now trying to convince him that member four is marine. And Isles and Isles were right, but they they were they never looked at Isla. They always looked at Garvelic. So they, Tony is right in the Garvelics. He is Niels's model of glacier marine may well apply in Isla, but they never went there to look at it. So uh, and uh, this is a quartz. This is a, this is a quartz site up here on the top of the top of the very uh, car park. So this is. This is um, on the coast of the. This is a drone photograph that we've been. To, uh, Doug Ben and I spent a lot of time on the on the Sound of Isla with drones. And we have these measuring poles here to try, and then we, then we basically stitch them all together in, orth, in, uh, on a, in an ortho fitted uh, map. That's why there's a big white hole here because there's actually a load of photographs all stitched together, and it's looking down on a down on a on a wave cut platform, and this is diamictite. And this is the yellow, it, everything is diamond, and there's big boulders in here in class. This, these red things are class of granite, these little pebble beds. This is a sort of diamond tight 
muddy, diamic type, tiny bits in it. And this is sand. Now, Tony's interpreted this as wedges, like, like we saw on that slope of, yeah, with the sort of political wedges. And Doug and I and Bruce and Ian and every, everyone else, apart from Tony, thinks these are inject pipes. These are beds of sand that have been injected. We've got these sort of load casts and all sorts of injection features. They sort of, they don't look quite like the polygons, yeah? So, with, and so it could be that this is a marine sequence. This is, this is what you'd expect in the Isles and Isles model, which is in, injection, you get injectites. And they're quite common in, in these, where you get high depositional rates, and you get these, uh, and you get some uh, mass flow deposits, which is what Eels and Eels said that the Great Breccia was. But they think we think they're dead wrong. But they might be their model might be right here. And this is a, a, a conglomerate, um, a, a bed here, which is, we think so. Sediment gravity flow, submarine sediment gravity flow. Not one of those deflation lags. Not a subaerial deposit. It's a submarine deposit. And this is this is dug with his. Uh, drone controller and we've annotated this photograph of this conglomerate here which is penetrated by these things that doesn't look like a wedge to me that looks like a, an injection feature of the load you, you dump this massive three or four meter lump of stuff into into muddy soup yeah which is what it would must have been if it was rain out from a from a, a floating ice shell you get you just get this soupy mud with rocks in it and then you dump this conglomerate on top of it and it just squishes and squeezes everything around here, yeah? and that's so what. There's the, uh, we've uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. This is this is I said this is an annotated drone picture. We we, we take the drone picture, and then we color it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? that's grass. That's grass. Hmm? That's yeah, that yellow. Sorry, that's yellow. Yeah. That's the sand. We've colored that in. It's just yeah. that you can see. It's just just for for. But illustration purposes, you know that that. So we, we know we we ground through. We sat there and draw, and we know that's a sand bed. Yeah, this is diamictite. This is a sand bed. Yeah. See, okay. and that goes up there, and that's a sand bed penetrating right through this breccia, yeah, you know, with the big class in it. On the coast of the Sound of Isla, we get uh, uh, into member five, which was mainly sand. Remember from my. Diagram I had the stratigraphic column, a lot of sand with some thin diamictites, D45, D46, D47, and D48 right at the very, very top before you get to the Bonnerhaven and Dolomite. Um, you get these uh, water injection. This is a big diapia feature. Uh, this is where the sand bed has done this. It goes whoop, up there like that, like a big you know, water punched up through it. Um, and you get these um, fallen boulder diamond type D45 is a, is a dolomitic breccia, which we think has got some var, um, boomer sequences. I think it's deep water dolomite with gravity flows in it. And at the very top, we get D48, which is a new one we found last two years ago. Uh, up on the, This is perhaps a Jura here. This is diamond type with very, very, very few class in it. And then suddenly there's this purple granite in it. It's my favorite rock. It's about, I keep saying it's about the size of my head, which is about right. It's about this size, and it just sits in this rock with no other class in it. And it's just this one lone stone, beautiful rounded, and it's purple. No one's, no one's allowed to hammer it. I won't let them. Um, this one, in, and there's a diamond. So this is, the, this is the very end. This is the last glacial pulse. Yeah? And then above that, we get Von Harben formation. So more, more fossils. These are stromatolite units in the, in the North Isla coast. The Bonnerhaven formation, they're big things. That's Ian Fairchild. So these are six, two meters thick, four, four meters across, big bioherms of dolomite, and stromat stromatitic dolomite. And you get these smaller ones here, um, these bioherms overlain by a storm layer. So this, this biohome is growing quite nicely off the seabed, like you see in Shark Bay, and then it gets washed over by a storm. So this is the carbonate at the top, which is not the same as what Paul Hoffman was standing on, pointing his finger out. Yeah? Because that's deep water. This is this is shallow water. This is this is subtide. This is tidal, tidal stuff. You know? It's not deep water at all. Um, so summarizing where we've got to, this is this is your uh, this is the member one, member two, member three, member four, member five, and really it's look at the last bit, the last thing here, which is the the glacial and non glacial intervals and floating ice is where we get definite drop stones. So that this is the disrupted beds. We get drop stones there, some valves there with the drop stones, and then it become 
the, the glaciation is here. The question is, those ones with the injectites are in here, D40, D41. The question is whether these are marine diamectites or subaerial diamectites, but basically above there, it's all marine. It's deep water, marine sedimentation. Yeah, and the, that D48, that lone stone is almost certainly a floating uh, ice shelf. Last bit of ice shelf dropping its nice purple boulder. So that's the story of the sort of event history of, uh, of, the, of the... So it's not one big diamectite, it's 48 diamectites pulsate with a, with, a, with a sort of maybe increasing in intensity to this great breccia. Yeah, lots of glacier tectonics, lots of weird stuff going on with the iron formation here. And the dolomites, and then uh, cyclicity here, low sedimentation rate, which is, gives you the dolomite, and then high sedimentation rate becoming marine, and you don't get the because you've got high sedimentation rate, you don't get dolomite cement, you get the white sandstone, you get quartz cemented sandstone. So the differences are basically sedimentation rate, not, not chemistry particularly. It's just that it's deposited quickly in marine waters. So so basically, subsidy probably quite low here, and you um, and substance increases. So sedimentation is more than subsidence at the bottom, but, oh, but the su su substance and sedimentation rate sort of flips the middle, and uh, the, uh, here you're getting more subsidence and sedimentation to your deep water deposit. There's your, there's your dolomite and disrupted beds. And that may be where the, arguably, the snowball earth form is, top of D13. And there's the two pictures that I showed you earlier, the one in Isla and the one with Doug sitting on it in and, um, now I'm going to talk about provenance. How are we, how are we doing for time? Are we? Hmm? So, I don't so far. So far. Sorry. I'm in the last this last leg here. Is that all right? Happy enough? Wait, okay. Right. Okay. Well. Okay, so there's some stones, nice pictures there. I'm going to wrap up this very quickly. These are these are the sorts of granites that I've been studying, um, and these class we've taken we've we've got a, quite a few samples of these, and we think they are true granite, mostly true granites, not cyanites, not monzonites. They're true granites, not alkali granites, but they're quite alkaline. They are uh, have got low. They've got a most of them have got a very pronounced europium negative anomaly in the rare earths. And they plot in mainly in the with, within plate or A-type granite. So we have a, I'm not going to go into that because that will take me another hour, but we have a we, quite diff, quite close definitive sort of granite. A lot of granites, a lot of them the same, yeah? And that's most of those are there. These pink porphyritic granites that are, that are uh, anorogenic A-type granites with negative europium, and they plot in the granitic field, yeah? And we quickly talk about feldspar. We need to talk about feldspar. Um, so we have two types of main feldspar, potassium and plagioclase. This is a typical uh, ternary uh, triangle diagram with plagioclase being the solid solution series between the calcium and the sodium plagioclase with this in the thin section with these stripes. Most of you are probably vaguely familiar, familiar with that and the, the solid solution series that goes. They all look the same apart from minor changes in in optical characters, but sodium, the sodium and the potassium feldspars don't mix so well. You get at the end member, you get orthoclase, which is often twinned like this, uh, quite clear or a bit turbid sometimes, and very prominent microcline with this sort of tart, lovely tart and twinning pattern. So they're potassium feldspars. You get one or the other of these. One's at different temperatures of things, um, different different mineralic crystal like photography, but they're both potassium aluminium silicates. And then down here, we get the, the they're not they don't mix together, they unmix. Yeah. So you get these perthites. It's called a perthite where you get the sodium and the potassium bit separated out into sort of layers or beads or rods or all sorts of things. So one of those one of those colors will be a sodium, one will be potassium. And often this happens as it cools. As the liquid cools, you'll get this perthite. If you've got it, you won't you won't you might not get and you might get perthetic threads and rods through the microcline, yeah. Or, or and if you get it, and if you get it perthetic, the other way is anti-perthite. So perthites are quite common uh, in the in the potassium feldspar. You also get what we call metasomatic feldspars, and you get a thing called patch perthite, which is where a lot of water has been introduced into the granite while it's cooling, and you get these sort of blobs of potassium and sodium feldspar in sort of blobs. It's called a patch perthite. 
And the thing that's really interesting in the potassium is a thing called the chessboard albide, which is this sort of a twinning, weird twinning pattern, you would think. And we think this is when a feldspar, which was probably somewhere in here, original, so originally here, the it's been metasomatized uh, during emplacement with a sodium-rich solution, which has pushed it this way and created this weird pattern. And, and all the potassium bits have gone out into things like biotite and, and uh, other things. So we get these, this metasomatism has created this albite called chessboard albite, which is quite rare in the literature. You won't find much written about chessboard albite, but every bloody granite in the Port Asier is stuffed full of it. All that pink stuff there in those rocks on the bench is chessboard albite. You won't find that in DH and Z books. You will never find it mentioned anywhere, but these granitic rocks in the Port Asier are full of chessboard albite. There's a picture, sort of blown up picture of it. This is a weird twinning, a sort of it looks like a bit of an albite turn, and it stops and starts and stops and starts. So you get this sort of checkerboard sort of picture. Yeah. And it's replaced, and that was, re that was replacing orthoclase. The original was orthoclase, and it was turning into chessboard albite. And we get chessboard albite uh, and microcline, but we only get micro microclines. In, this is my section here microclines, the green one. And you get microcline only in the white sandstones. You don't get it below that. But you get it all the way above there, in, in all the rocks in the Dalradian, above the Bonahab and Dolomite, above the Port Asque, it's got microcline in it, and everything below has got microcline in it. But the Port Asque doesn't have microcline, but it does have chessboard albite, which doesn't occur there, and doesn't occur there. So it's actually weird. Microcline is only found in the white sandstones, none in the diamictites, apart from D48. The very last one seems to have a bit. And it's common before and after, and the chessboard albite is none in the pre- and post-Port Asque, and it occurs in the diamictites and the sandstones in the Port Asque. So we have this weird provenance of, so these granites are weird. Yeah. What age are they? These are the ages. This is, uh, so this is virtually all the class we've ever analyzed uh, are uh, around a, sort of cluster around about 1,800. So Paleoproterozoic, same age as the Rins complex, which is obviously the basement of Isla, which is 1.8 billion, 1,800 million years old as well. We have one Rapakivi granite, which I'll talk about in a second, and that is dated at about 1780. Yeah? And we have one class of, of gneiss, which is really old, and that's quite old in the Archean. That's old on some of the Louisian. Yeah? One of these classes in that sample there is a, is a gneiss as well. So we do have some gneissos class, which are possibly Archean gneisses. Yeah? And where do they come from? So these, this is the, this, these are the places, these 1.8 billion year old alkali granites with chessboard out could have come from everywhere from Labrador to uh, southern Greenland. This is Greenland here, uh, Rockall. Um, we think the Rockall microcontinent has got a lot of this 1.8 billion year old stuff in it. Uh, uh, Mayo, Rins complex in here, and then the Trans Scandinavian Igneous Belt over in uh, Sweden, Norway. So these are the sort of candidates for where these rocks may have come from. And I've been through, these are what we would want to see, 1.8, undeformed granites, chessboard albite, negative anomaly, heavy earth profile, within plate signature, and with the 1.78 rapid kiwi. And we need to then see which of these, uh, so it's, the, the Rins complex has none of them. So the stuff that's right underneath it does not match it at all in any of, the, any of these characteristics. Um, Rockall and Stanton Banks offshore, we've got some samples there. They're a bit better. We've got some 1.8 uh, crystallization ages. We've got some underformed granites. We've got negative anomalies. We've got some things that are looking a bit better. But the, the Stanton Banks and Rockall stuff is full of microcline, not chessboard albi. And it doesn't have any rapid either. Uh, the Julian Haar batholith, which is 1.8 billion years old in Greenland, big, big batholith. Um, it's a volcanic arc batholith. It's not within plate granite. Um, and, and the Rapakivis are, are okay. We've got the right age of Rapakivis in there. Labrador doesn't look too bad either, but the, the, uh, it doesn't have any Rapakivi granite. Uh, Scandinavia, yeah, now we're getting somewhere that's getting quite good. It has virtual matches. You can go to trans Scandinavian English belt and match it up quite nicely. And Amazonia looks quite neat as well, uh, matches quite nicely. You can find rocks of all that stuff in, in uh, quite a large chunk of South America. So. Uh, that's sort of where you get to with the petrology. I'm going to quickly talk about detrital zircon. This is a whole new story um, that's just coming in. Uh, diamictites have been analyzed and they've got Archean uh, 
grains in them, as well as the 1.8 peak, which you'd expect, just given that we've got class that we've dated at 1.8, and we've got younger stuff as well. So our class, there, there's more stuff in the rocks than just the class we've analyzed, and they've got and they've got Archean data in it. And this is all Laurentian stuff. And most of the Laurentian dimictite sequences we know of on in Laurentia have Archean. So you've got Amazonia, absolutely none of the dimictites in Amazonia have Archean. It doesn't look like, and these don't look like Amazonian dimictites, nor do they look like Baltica ones. So the dimictites, the, the detrital zircon story is telling a bit different story to the petrology. Yeah, so we, 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 we fundamentally think we're still dealing with some rocks in Laurentia, but we've never seen them. And this is a reflection I've put together of what the Iranian basin may have looked like. Maybe we've got a failed rift. And we're actually inboard of a microcontinental ribbon that was that now underlies the Midland Valley, the Slishwood, the Tyrone Central Inlier, Loch Nefui Arc, and the Dashwoods Train in Newfoundland. So we and the Yapitus Ocean actually opened outboard of that, and we may have a deeper centre here. And it's possible that these hidden rocks here in this arc that now underlies these arcs, that's where it came from, because it ain't come from there, it ain't come from Labrador, it ain't come from Greenland. It's unlikely to come from Rockall, uh, and doesn't like it's come from Baltica. Um, so we've got a a sort of crazy uh, situation where we it, this could be where they've come from, but we have no evidence of it. So we've got the Pilaskeg in this failed rift inboard of this microcontinental ribbon. That's how I sort of envisage the the, the, the Port Askeg, uh epicenter. And maybe this is what happened during glaciation. We're getting sands sands coming out of Laurentia into the Port Askeg formation uh, into the deeper centers actually. Coming off the off the continent and then actually coming actually down the rift, and then during ice ages you get ice coming from the southeast. Remember the folds coming from the southeast, a completely different direction from the sands, which have come from the north from the Laurentia. So this kind of model fits. It sort of adds makes two and two make five. But you never know. It sort of it tries to sort of fit the evidence of the sand coming in this way from the Laurentia, um, and then the, the glaciation coming in from maybe a, an ice field here. It may or may not be true, but that's where I'm at at the moment with it. Analogs, I mean, can't talk about this, we have no time, but we think the Ross Shelf in Antarctica may be a good analog for this. We've got 34, 30 or 50, 30 or 40 million years of right sort of age range, failed rift in the Ross, underneath the Ross Shelf. So this may be a secret, there's a lot of work done on that, that maybe that's a good analog for the Port Askeg. Um, the carbon isotope trend, we've talked a little bit about it. Um, there's, the, there's the Garvelic anomaly. The problem with the snowball Earth story is that if it was a big unconformity at top D13 with a huge time gap, which is what you'd expect for a snowball Earth, that isotope change, that this, this, this negative back to negative isotope stuff here should have shifted over here somewhere, and it hasn't. So the isotopes are telling us, mm, maybe the snowball Earth story doesn't quite work. So this, again, is sort of evidence for it and against it. Yeah. And we've got a weird, uh, weird isotope on top of Bonnerhaven as well to look at and try and understand. But that's the top D13 anomaly, which is what you've shown the picture. Uh, very end of the glaciation, why isn't, why isn't there a nice Paul Hoffman cap carbonate? Um, the end of the ice ages here at D48, uh, dominantly marine sandstones, and, the, and we've got a lot of subsidence, a swamp, the climatic signal is what we think. We've got a little, little winnow dolomite at the very top. And we've got one D48, and, the, and so we've got dolomite when we get sedimentation pauses, which is very different to the snowball earth cap story. So we don't have the typical Paul Hoffman cap carbonate. We have, it doesn't look like that at all. So we, we're still trying to understand why, why it's different here. I want to just go back to this Sturtian stuff very quickly. We think it's Sturtian for several reasons. We have this thing called molar tooth structures in below the Port Askeg, which only occur in the in the pre-Sturtian across the world. The strontium isotope profile also tells us that it must be Sturtian. The ironstones only occur in Sturtian rocks uh, around the world, and the detrital zircon story, which is another part of the detrital zircon story. We have now got the youngest youngest single grains. And we now see in, mem in the Garvelic, 740, 630, 690, 680, 680, 690, 7, 670, 660. A sort of stratigraphic progression of unroofing of, of, of um, contemporaneous felsic volcanism somewhere near 
the Potaskeg, maybe windblown dust from the Carolina, from the East Yapetus, West, West Yapetus. So we, we're seeing, this is just about to be published. Um, Elias uh, Rugen and myself and Tony are writing a paper on this at the moment to, to uh, help publish this before the memoir because it's so important. It's telling us we've got uh, zircon data that it can almost date date the Port Ascade formation because of this this sort of law, supposition of, uh, of, of growing of changing dates. Um, why is it matter um, There's one rhenium osmium date from Selby and um, Rooney that says that the Calaculi slate underneath it is 660. If that is right, then the uh, then there's no way Port Ascade could be sturdy and have to be Maranoan. We don't. We don't think that date is right. We think that the date might be right. We think it may date pyrite or even hydrocarbon generation. So we think it's not actually dating deposition. And some people who study the Dalradian think that the Dalradian has got to be can't be any older than 750, based on other evidence from the Dalradian. If that's the case, you can't have you couldn't have the Potasque being sturdy. And the base is 750. This is 720. And there's the whole Appin group um, and, the, and the Gramping group to fit in. No, so just go back to the thing. Can we can we get our golden spike here? Yeah, is it going to be there? That the new zircon stuff could well do that. Tell us that. And here is the cryogenic subcommission on the way to Isla a few years ago to look at those rocks, and maybe we'll get it. I think that's it. And they're the rocks that are on the table. You can have a look at those. Thank you. <laughs>